بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليذهبه على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وإقرارا به وتوحيدا وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما مزيدا أما بعد بريف um, review of what we mentioned in last night's class or not last night's class but yesterday's class and let's not forget brothers and sisters this session of ours is not meant to be a general lecture it's not meant to be a general muhadara it's supposed to be a session for huh raghibin fil istifada yani students of knowledge in arabic and in english who want a bit more bidin la hispano hotal so what did we mention in the last class? ما الذي ذكرنا في الدرس الذي سلفه باليمين باليمين أي نعم. The golden rule of uh, always looking beheaded in 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 batch or in I don't know how to to say it in English in gang and not just focusing on one text. Al hadith. If you don't <coughs> look at the hadith collectively, you may make a mistake. You may make an error. Rather, one hadith with several different riwayat, al-fad, turuq, awjuh, versions of one hadith will, will lead you to understanding it properly, let alone one hadith in line with the other hadith. Uh -huh. And this is with regards to authenticity, and this is with regards to the fiqh of the hadith, learning and understanding them. As Imam Muhammad said, إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَنْ يَسِحَّ لَكَ حَدِيثُكَ فَضْرِبْ بَعْضَهُ بِبَعْضٍ Al-hadith, إِنْ لَمْ تَجْمَ تُرُقَهُ لَمْ يَتَبَيَّنْ خطأه آثار كثيرة ورد عن الإمة في أهمية جمع طرق وجمع الألفاظ والتوفيق بينها وعدم العجلة ها في ظن التعارض والتخالف وهذا هي نقطة مهمة جدا لطلبة العلم ها it's very important for students of knowledge and we said even in the field of دعوة in the field of دعوة علم الحديث and mastery of it will aid you when you talk to the Christians, when you talk to the atheists, when you defend Islam on social media, ilm al-hadith will help you. And the proper training in this science is an indestructible sword that can cut through any batil if it's properly used. If it's what? If it's properly used. Khairin, inshallah. What else did we mention yesterday? Idris. Hmm? Al Dunya Jannatu Al Kafir Wusijun al Mu'min. Khair inshallah. The narration that Shaykh Muhammad Ali mentioned last night about Hafid bin Hajar being the senior judge of Egypt and the man who came and asked him, How is this your prophet says that it's the paradise for me? and the prison for you. Very beneficial story, and I want to just add a few things to that story today, and one of the, one of the versions of this story. And that was that they say, uh, Hafid ibn Hajar, whenever he went to yani, uh, do a case, his job was flexible, he wouldn't just travel by himself on a horse or a camel, but he would have like, you know, a buggy, okay? Like a little small type of caravan with him, proving more wealth. Everybody understand this? And obviously he's a senior judge. He's going to be dressed a certain way. He's going to smell a certain way. He's going to look a certain way, etc. So they say that he was traveling, you know, in his entourage, his collection of horses, camels, his buggy or whatever, caravan. And they came across a man who not only was a non-Muslim, but he was a Jew. He was a Yehudi. And he was, they say, Zayat. He was someone who sold olives or someone who sold olive oil. So obviously the Zayat is going to be Greasy and dirty. It's going to be shabby. It's going to look really, really, you know. Everybody understand this? So they say that the Jewish man walked up to the buggy of the caravan and he stopped it. He said, Halt, stop right here. And he called out to Ibn Hajar. And he said, What Sheikh Muhammad Ali mentioned last night, your prophet said, Jannatul Kafir, was Sijnul Mu'min, Sijnul Mu'min, Jannatul Kafir. How is this? And then Hafiz ibn Hajar, Allah, he replied to him and he says, The pleasure that I'm in. Consider to what's in hereafter, vice versa, what he mentioned. And last but not least, 
After the Jewish man heard that statement, he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. He accepted Islam based off of what had taken place. Khairan inshallah. Ahsan Idris. What else did we mention yesterday? Anything else? The right hand. When giving da'wah, we should go on the offensive and be confident. When, when giving da'wah, it shouldn't always be defensive. It shouldn't always be apologetic, soft and weak, and oh, it doesn't mean this and doesn't mean that. Huh? Even when you're on the defensive, it should be what? Offense as well. Or offense and defense at the same time. Offense and defense at the same time. Defend this lamb and attack the balta at the same time. And the da'iyah has to be strong. Islamically strong. Your ilm has to be strong. Your personality has to be strong. Your character has to be strong. Because you're defending the deen of Islam. And nothing about the deen of Islam is weak. Nothing. Hmm? And this is because the deen of Islam was sent down by someone who is an Aziz. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's an Aziz. He has the Izza. And he gives it. Hmm? Khayran, inshallah. Tayyip, what else did we mention yesterday? Briefly. Fadal. The majority of the people in Jannah are poor people. Tayyip, ascent. Something to soften one's heart. To think about the dunya. And it's reality. Khair, what else did we mention yesterday? That's it. Fadl. Uh, I type in Arabic. Mom, la mushkil. Uh, you mentioned that prayer isn't a proper translation of Salah. Prayer isn't a proper translation of Salah. That was yesterday? Or Saturday? Yesterday was Saturday. I thought I was off. I'm Matt. It was yesterday. It was yesterday or Saturday? I wasn't here. So what was the translation? We said that prayer in that chapter was what? Wrong. Yeah. Is that it makes a person feel like that it's a what? Salah. Because Muslims, we have our own English culture as well. We have our own what? English culture. There are certain words and terminologies that have been Islamicized. No doubt about that. Even though they're in what? In English. Everybody got this? Everybody clear on this one? Say pray. I have to make prayer. I have to pray. Huh? Pray. Naam? In most cases, that's what? Physical salah. And when most Muslims say these prayer like this, say make what? Make dua for me. Everybody got this? Khayyan, inshallah. Tayyip, tafadl. Who's better? Who's closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ghani al-Shakir or al-Faqir al-Sabir? And what did your research lead you to? What did Ibn Qayyim say? What was Ibn Qayyim's tarjih? What was his conclusion? Raise your hand if you read the book last night, if you went back to the book. Taya. That's good, but I know that you're freestyling. Huh? Like this. There's nothing wrong with freestyling in certain times and places, but I want everyone to go back to the book. Taya, what, did you, what, what conclusion did you get? Al Ghaniyu Shakir. Ibn Qayyim or you? Ibn Qayyim, the Ghani Shakir is better. Tayyip, Tayyip, inshallah. And you. He doesn't have a choice. Tayyip, Tayyip, inshallah. And you agree with that? Fadal, Abdurrahman. Not to Afiq. Jayid. Yalla. Baris. The reason why I disagree with you is because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was also used for. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Tayyip. He's the best example for us. يعني يعني أنت تقول الإنسان قد يختار الفقر كذلك. انتبهوا. He says that the poor person doesn't have a choice but to be poor. Like I'm not me because I'm not in this fight. This between you and Abdurrahman. He's saying the fakir, the poor person, could also, I mean, he could choose to be poor, and it's not something that's forced. But the rizq is written, Tayyip. The rizq is written for both of them. So the Ghaniya Shakir, he doesn't have a choice except to be rich. 
تفضل هو يو تاكن هيم نوت مي تفضل Ty, I want to say something to the brothers and the sisters, inshallah. Very, very important. For Tulab al Ilm and also for 9 of 5 Muslim. From the most, not the most, but from the most beneficial ways of truly learning and benefiting and understanding what you read and what you hear is debating. Debating. Not arguing, fighting, okay? I have my side, yes or no. But to have scholastic what? Debates. Every single week, we have an issue, wiping over the socks. For three days for a traveler or unlimited time. You research, I research, three brothers here, three brothers there. We come on Saturday and we have a what? A debate. And we have someone who has more knowledge than us who moderates the debate. Sisters, they get together, they have a debate. Is it obligatory to cover the hands in the face or just recommend it? You read, you research, you study. Wallah, you're going to discover things that you thought you knew. You thought you understood. You're going to discover things you never even heard about. Proofs, evidences, statements, atal. Let alone it strengthens the brotherhood and the sisterhood. It's my friend, it's my brother. We debated. We, you see what I'm saying to you? I learned, he learned. It's very beneficial. Especially for the tulab al ilm. And you're not going to find a serious tulab al ilm except that one time or another they do what, Samir? They spar, they fence. And it's not, I'm, I know more than you, you know more than me, I'm going to beat you. It's about sharpening, staying sharp, staying fresh. And coming across what he has because he looks at things differently. I look at things differently. He studied in a different place. He was in Egypt, he was in Yemen, he was in Saudi. Everybody brings something to the table. And at the end, the, the knowledge grows. So this is a good thing that we're trying to do. Everybody understand this? It's not about ego. It's about benefiting. Everybody got this? So this is my nasiha. For the brothers, for the sisters, you should come together. You should have a, you know, like a little debate club. Once a month, once a week. Based off of knowledge, of course. With a sincere intention. You're my brother in Islam. That's it. Everybody understand this? And don't underestimate huh, the benefits of this. Fadl. He had to be unique. Yes. So this shows a lot of non Muslims when they read this, they you know they get touched because it's he's a humble uh, leader. Although he had control of all the state, he was you know living the same standard of the law as other Muslims in, in the state. And the other thing is when we saw so we just the Prophet said, but when we talk about the uh, the non prophet Abu Siddiq he had wealth. Right? He was Shaq. Uh Abdul Rahman is now Atman al Afan. All of these were Al Hadi and Shaq. Right? Mm. And uh, all of them yeah. Try it. So this is my Tuwa Fika. Shaykh Allah. Khair. Jayat, Fadl Akhi. most important Akhi, don't ever forget the true spirit of ha seeking ilm is that she it should be competition. Not for the dunya, but for Jannah, for ilm, for Islamic excellence. Naam? You should be willing to say, La wafiq, jump on them, throw them. Everybody understand this? It's how we learn with each other. Everybody got this? It's how we what? It's how we benefit. Simon, he WhatsApps me from Canada to America. Yeah, Sheikh, you mentioned this in the class, that's wrong. La, where do you find this hadith? He gets me all the time. And what do I do, Samir? I take it, alhamdulillah, I benefit, we learn, we study. Everybody got this? You shouldn't be weak. Naam? al ya Sheikh. Taya, Allah ya Okay, anybody else, any sisters did the research from Ibn Qayyim? Any sisters go back to the book from Ibn Qayyim? Ma huwa ra'yu ki Samir? Aya. طيب هناك عبارة علمية مشهورة في الترجيح مهررة يقول بعض أهل العلم إذا استويا في التقوى استويا في الفضل إذا استويا في التقوى استويا في الفضل كأن هذا الذي تريد تقول 
إذا استويا في في التقوى استويا في الأرض وإلا قد يكون غني شاكر وقد يكون آه طيب it all what all depends طيب تفضل الاستواء اذا استوى والا قد يكون هذا افضل وقد يكون هذا ما ذكرت شيء اه اه انت طيب طيب لكن انتبهوا الفائده الطالب طالب ان لا بد ايش يحافظ على على العبارات المهرره الواضحه امم منضبطه دقيقه خاصة في في المناقشة. It's not always what you say, but sometimes what? It's how you say it. Mm-hmm. طيب شيخ توافق على هذا ولا ما زلت مع الفقير الصابر؟ أنت؟ آه. الآن تذكرت الحديث. I remember the talks about the four types of people. طيب. One with money, knowledge. One with money, uh, one with knowledge, no money. One with no money, no knowledge, and one with نريد الترجيح يا شيخ خلاصة على دلة كثيرة آه نريد رأيك أنت مذهبك أنت حسب التقوى طيب خير إن شاء الله nothing else anything from the sisters before we move forward أيوة صدى There's something that I, I, I didn't master at all, but I remember you talk about the, the term Allahu and uh, Ya Allah or something. Allahumma, like that. naam. Allahumma, yeah. Right, so that's I, right. That was a homework assignment as well. Who did that? Allahumma. Right. Follow. So I, I just, I'm, I, I have a very, very, very limited uh, Arabic knowledge. So when I talked with my wife and she told me that uh, it was like similar, I think, like Ya Allah and Allah mine, it was only applicable to Allah for some reason that I think she did not fully grasp, but in that line of... Ta'ib, jazakallah khairan for doing the research. You benefit from the research even if you don't find a specific answer. First and foremost is the reward from Allah. Because seeking knowledge is ibadah. Now, let alone the beneficial information that you get. We can never ever forget seeking ilm is what? It's ibadah, it's worship. From the greatest acts of worship. Tayyip, tfadl. Uh, I found that it's when you take away the ya, ya Allah, you have to replace it with ma, neem mushaddad. So ya is two letters and neem mushaddad is two letters. So it comes up and up. So it's pretend to the Arabic language now. Yeah. You're saying, illa sarfiya, fa'abal al ma'na. Limadha al meem. Tfadl. طيب والميم ما هو السر كيف يعني روحنا يا إلى ميم خير إن شاء الله طيب let's move forward uh, today's hadith we have chapter number eight or I believe chapter number seven the author رحمه الله تعالى says باب خشية أو باب and you know we say باب as well خشية بسط الدنيا والتنافس فيها اقرأ باب خشية بسط الدنيا والتنافس فيها عن عمر بن عوف رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بعث أبي عبيدة بن جرح بعث بعث أبي أبا أبا عبيدة بن جرح رضي الله عنه إلى البحرين يأتي بجزيتها وكان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هو صالح 
أهل 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 البحرين وأمر عليهم العلاء بن الحضرمي فقدم أبو عبيد فقدم فقدم أبو عبيدة بمال من البحرين فسمعت الأنصار بقدوم أبي عبيدة فوافى فوافى فسمعت الأنصار فسمعت الأنصار بقدوم نعم بقدوم أبي عبيدة فوافى فوافى صلاة الفجر مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فلما صلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم انصرف فتعرضوا له فتبسم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حين رآهم ثم قال أظنكم سمعتم أن أبا عبيدة قدم بشيء من البحرين فقالوا أجل يا رسول الله قال أبشروا فأبشروا فأبشروا وأملوا ما يسركم فوالله من فقر أخشى عليكم ولكني أخشى عليكم أن تبسط الدنيا عليكم كما بسطت على من كان قبلكم فتنافسوها كما كما تنافسوها وتهلككم كما أهلكتهم. أحسن تبارك الله فيك. وغيره؟ anyone else reading for us today for Sahih Muslim مختصر Sahih Muslim. طيب. The author رحمه الله he says باب خشية بسط الدنيا والتنافس فيها. عن عمرو بن عوف رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بعث أبا عبيدة بن الجراح رضي الله عنه إلى البحرين يأتي بجزيتها. The author says fear says worldly love and competition. Worldly love and competition, which is not necessarily a bad translation, but it doesn't give the full meaning as the author said it in Arabic. خشية the fear of the harm. And a consequence of worldly competition. But it's much deeper than just worldly competition. Because it says in Arabic, Bastu dunya. The worldly life being opened up for you, being given to you, being handed to you. Because I can have worldly competition and still be poor. I can fight and scratch and connive for basic, measly things. And it's still blameworthy in Al Islam. It's still blameworthy in Al Islam. That's not the same as Bastu dunya. Riches, wealth being opened up for the Muslims. The Muslims who live this simple, basic life begin to live an extravagant, lavish life. And then, when the riches came, when the wealth came, then there was the tenafus. So, that translation, once again, is, is doesn't give it true justice. Khairan, inshallah, moving forward. It says here, narrator Amr ibn Auf, the Messenger of Allah, Sayyid Salam, sent Abu Ubaidah bin al Jarrah, radiallahu anhu. To Bahrain to collect the zakat. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had established peace with the people of Bahrain and appointed Al Ala bin Al Hadrami as their governor. When Abu Ubaidah came from Bahrain with revenues, the Ansar heard of Abu Ubaidah's arrival, which coincided with the time of the morning prayer with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led them in the morning prayer and finished, the Ansar approached him. He looked at them and smiled. Then he said. I think that you heard about the arrival of Abu Ubaidah with goods from Bahrain. They said, Yes, O Messenger of Allah. He said, Rejoice and hope for that which will please you. By Allah, it is not poverty I'm worried about, but I'm worried that this world will be opened up for you as it was opened up for those before you, and that you will compete with each other over it as they competed for it, and it will destroy you as it destroyed them. Allahu Akbar. Prophet Sallallahu tells us, I'm not afraid that you're going to be poor. I'm not worried about poverty. I'm worried about the exact opposite. I'm worried about the exact opposite. That you will have wealth. You will have luxury. You will have revenue. The dunya, it says, how we open up. It will be expanded for you. And then once it's expanded, you get a taste of luxury. You get a taste of um, this type of lavish, non-Islamic lifestyle. Then it will destroy you. Because there comes envy, jealousy, treachery, there comes fornication, adultery, cheating, all of the sick practices of those who have wealth and royalty will now be offered to you. Everybody got this? So once again, this hadith, it teaches us the concept of zuhd, is that in general, not all of the time, but in general, when the worldly life is opened up, it's going to be a problem. Secondly, once again, it shows us the mean and base nature of the hayat dunya And as we say, money is the root of what? All evil. When the people were simple, basic, tulab al-ilm, studying, everything was fine. 
The moment this one got invited to this conference, the moment this one got this ijazah, the moment he became the imam of the masjid, the moment he got the attention from the sisters, the moment he was the sheikh of the markaz, the moment he got his doctorah, the moment kada, the moment kada, then his refutation. Akhta and Hassan kada and so on and so on and so forth. But when they were all poor and simple, on one level, everything was tight. Akhuna, al fadl But then when he went beyond them, some type of dunya was offered to him. Not saying that he wanted the dunya, but it was opened up. Then came the competition. Then came the hasid. Then came the tabagul, then the tadabur. Everybody understand this? So this goes to show us once again how the tulab al ilm need to read these ahadith. You need to study these ahadith. And there is no doubt we have become far from the sunnah of the Prophet. And it doesn't mean that other books are bad and other books are negative. But we have become far from the sunnah. Seeking ilm and the do's and the don'ts of seeking ilm should be initially based off of the hadith of the Prophet. Alhamdulillah, that's why we compiled 40 hadith on seeking knowledge. Not 40 athar, not an explanation of this one, but 40 statements, 40 actions, 40 stories, 40 things of Muhammad with regards to what you should do and what you shouldn't do in seeking knowledge. So therefore, once the dunya is opened up, comes competition. When the competition comes, the third and final step is destruction. فَتُهْلِكُكُمْ It will destroy you. Because if you are one jama'ah, now there's dunya, now there's hasad, now there's tanafus. Instead of one strong, solid unit, now there are five masjids. And now the enemies of Islam, physically or not, will come and conquer and take over, continue to separate, split and divide. And it will be destruction. It's chaos, it's chaotic. One day we're together, the next day we're refuting each other. One day you're upon khayr, you have knowledge, you've benefited the people. The next day you're ignorant, you know nothing. Warn from him, burn your tapes, burn his books, get rid of him. He's no good. One after another, after another, after another, after another. That's destruction. And we have seen that in our countries in the West. We've seen that what? In the countries in the West. Let alone just the worldly things. But we're talking about Talib al-In right now. And Dawah is a means of destruction. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. Tayyib, ala dibadu. عن عبد الله بن بن عمر بن العاص عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال إذا فتحت عليكم فارس والروم أي قوم أنتم قال عبد الرحمن بن عوف نقول كما أمرنا الله قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أو غير ذلك تتنافسون ثم تتحاسدون ثم تتدابعون ثم تتباغضون أو نحو ذلك ثم تنطلقون في مساكن المهاجرين وتجعلون بعضهم على رقاب بعض طيب أحسنت chapter 8 says competition and envy over worldly temptations very similar to the previous chapter very similar to the previous chapter it says hadith number 2081 Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As narrated that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said when Persia and Rome will be opened for you what kind of people will you become then? the Prophet asked this to his Sahaba what kind of people will, be, will you be when you conquer the lands of Persia and Rome? It says here Abdurrahman ibn Awf said we should do as Allah Azzawajal commands us the Messenger of Allah وسلم, says nothing else besides it you sure? That's it? You get all of this wealth? Your lifestyle changes, you're going to be the same? You're going to do what Allah Azza wa tells you to do? Are you sure? It then says, You would in fact envy one another. Listen carefully. Then defeat one another. And hate one another? Or said something similar? Then you will go to the poor of the weak immigrants and appoint some of them as leaders on others. خير إن شاء الله هذا ذي بعده باب ما الدنيا في الآخرة إلا مثل ما يجعل أحدكم الأصبع دنيا عن المستورج أخي بني فهر قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم والله ما الدنيا في الآخرة إلا مثل مثل ما يجعل أحدكم إصبعه مثل ما يجعل أحدكم مثل ما يجعل أحدكم 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 أصبعه هذا وأشار يحيى بالسبابة في اليم فلينظر بما يرجع 
chapter 9, this world and the hereafter is equal to only what a finger takes when dipped in a sea. A finger, you dip it in the sea, how many drops of water fall back into the sea? What damage was done to the sea? What loss did the sea incur when you put your finger in and took it out? Insignificance of the drops of water with regards to the sea and one finger. Al Mustawrid radiallahu anhu, the brother of the sons of Fihr, narrated that the Messenger of Allah him, said, By Allah, this world and hereafter is equal only to your index finger takes from a sea. The Prophet said, raises the index finger, see what it would take. Al Adi Ba'da. عن ابي هريره انه سمع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول ان ثلاثه من بني اسرائيل ابرس واقرع واعمى فاراد الله ان يبتليهم فبعث اليه الملك فاتى الابرس فقال اي شيء احب اليك قال لون لون حسن وجلد حسن ويذهب عني الذي قد قدر الناس قال فمسحه فمسحه فذهب عنه قدره 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 وأعطي لونا حسنا وجلدا حسنا قال فأي المال أحب إليك قال الإبل أو قال البقر شك إسحاق إلا أن الأبرس أو الأقرع قال أحدهما الإبل وقال الآخر البقر قال فأعطيه ناقة فأعطي فأعطي ناقة عشراء عشراء بالتحريك عشراء فأعطي ناقة عشراء فقال بارك الله لك فيها قال فأتى الأقرع فقال أي شيء أحب إليك قال شعر حسن ويذهب عني هذا الذي قد قدرني الناس قال فمسحه فذهب عنه قال وأعطي شعرا حسنا قال فأي المال أحب إليك قال البقر فأعطي بقرة حاملة وقال بارك الله تعالى لك فيها قال فأتى الأعمى فقال أي شيء أحب إليك قال أن يرد أن يرد الله إلي بصري فأبصر به الناس قال فمسحه فرد الله إليه بصره قال فأي المال أحب إليك قال الغنم فأعطي شاة والدا فأنتج فأنتج هذان قال وولد هذا فكان لهذا واد من الإبل ولهذا واد من البقر ولهذا واد من الغنم قال ثم إنه أتى الأبرس في صورة في صورته وهيئته فقال رجل مسكين قد انقطع بالحبال في رجل مسكين قد انقطع بالحبال في سفري فلا بلاغ لي اليوم إلا بالله عز وجل ثم بك ثم بك أسألك بالذي أعطاك اللون الحسن الحسن والجلد الحسن والمال بعيرا أتبلغ 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 عليه في سفري فقال الحقوق كثيرة فقال كأني أعرفه ألم تكن أبرس يقدرك الناس فقيرا فأعطاك الله فقال إنما وردت هذا المال هذا المال كابرا عن كابر فقال إن كنت كاذبا فصي فصي فصيرك فصيرك الله إلى ما كنت قال وأتى الأقرع في صورته وهيئته فقال له مثل ما قال لهذا ورد عليه مثل ما رد على هذا فقال إن كنت كاذبا فصيرك الله إلى ما كنت قال وأتى الأعمى في صورته وهيئته فقال له رجل مسكين وابن سبيل انقطعت في الحبال في سفري فلا بلاغ لي اليوم إلا بالله ثم بك أسألك بالذي رد عليك بصرك شاة أتبلغ بها في سفري فقال قد كنت أعمى قد كنت قد كنت أعمى فرد الله قد كنت قد كنت أعمى عندك بالضم ما فيش بال بالفتحة طيب طيب قال عيد عيد فقال قد كنت أعمى فرد الله هو بالضم نعم حسنت قد كنت أعمى نعم قد كنت أعمى فرد الله إلي بصري فخذ ما شئت ودع ما شئت فوالله لا أجهدك فلا أجهدك اليوم شيئا أخذته لله تعالى فقال أمسك ما لك فإنما ابتليتم فقد رضي عنك وسقط على صاحبك
طيب بارك الله فيكم وصلت هي سيز هير بالفتحه هذا غلط خطا انتبهوا لنسختك طيب سيز هير شابتر 10 في الابتلاء بالدنيا وكيف يعمل فيها سيز هير affliction in this world and what to do ما الفرق بين الابتلاء والبلاء هل بينهما فرق البلاء والابتلاء بينهما فرق ما هو هم ما الفرق بينهما في سياق الشر هم توافق على هذا وين عبد الرحمن؟ ها؟ الابتلاء بالاثنين والبلاء ها؟ طيب خير ان شاء الله. says here chapter 10 affliction in this world and what to do. so the translation here is what? translation of what? says affliction meaning what? Negativity. That's not necessarily accurate. Babun filibtilai bid dunya. The man was blind. Allah Azza wa Jal returned to him his sight, wealth, etc. He was afflicted or he was tested and then blessed. What should it do? It is. No, no. So it's not necessarily shar. It's not necessarily negative. But it's mujarrad imtihan. A test. Some passed, some failed. All right, got this. Al Muhim, inshallah, you you guys live in a Torah, you have that. Ma'an al Bala wa ma'an al Ibtila. Hmm? Khairin, inshallah, wa farq bainhuma. Tay, it says here, fil Ibtila ibid dunya. Test in the worldly life and not affliction. It's not necessarily a valid translation. In this world and what to do. Wa kayfa ya'manu fiha. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated hadith number 2083. That he heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Allah will will to test three persons from the children of Israel who are a leper, a blind, and a bald headed. So he sent them an angel who came to the leper and said, says here, Fabatha ilayhim malakan. He sent them an angel. How was the angel sent to them? In the state of an angel or the state of a human being? In most cases, in the translations of Dar es Salaam, they have an abundance of captions, an abundance of parentheses. So it should have, they, should have been, they should have done what here? Without a doubt. Fi surat basha. Even if it's not mentioned in Arabic. They should have put here, Allah sent them an angel in the form of a man. Everybody got this? And this is a widespread problem in many translations. They put captions and brackets where they shouldn't be. It makes it confusing and cumbersome, the translation. You read one sentence and it's three, four, five different parentheses and captions. And when it is vague and something needs a caption, needs parentheses, they what? They don't put it, as we see. Everybody got this? Because if I read this, Allah sent them an angel. The first thing I'm thinking about is what? An angel. Everybody understand this? And not an actual human being that looks poor, beat down, a wayfaring traveler. Everybody got this? If they saw a malik, an angel, do you think they would have said what they said and done what they've done? Everybody got this? So this is another example of how many translations need to be revamped. They need to be what? They need to be revamped. Khairan, inshallah. It says here, he sent them an angel who came to the leper and said, What thing do you like most? He replied, Good color and good skin. For the view have a strong aversion to me. The angel touched him and he was cured and given a good color and beautiful skin. The angel asked him, What kind of property do you like best? He replied, camels or cows. So he was given a pregnant she camel and the angel said, may Allah bless it for you. The angel then went to the bald headed man and said, what thing do you like most? He said, I like good hair and wish to be cured of this baldness for the people feel repulsion for me. The angel touched him and then he was cured and given good hair. The angel asked him, what kind of property do you like best? He said, cows. The angel gave him a pregnant cow and said, may Allah bless it for you. The angel went to the blind man and he asked, what thing do you like best? He said, I like that Allah restore my eyesight so I may see the people. Look carefully at the hadith. The leper, the bald headed man, what did they say? I like to do what? 
What did he say? What did he say? It's a very important part of the hadith, the balagh of the hadith. He says, what did he say? I want good skin, I want good color. I want my hair to come back. And the blind man said what? La. Somebody said first. That's not what he said first. Who restored the vision? Hey, wow. What are you thinking, cop? Thinking goofy. He said, Juan. He said, for Allah to give me back my eyesight. The blind man had what? Ta'addaba ma'Allah. He loved He had respect for Allah. And he mentioned Allah's name. And knew that Allah was the one that gives the blessings and takes them away. The leper said, I just want what? No, he never not mentioned Allah's name. The leper did not what? He didn't mention Allah's name. Huh? The bald headed man didn't what? He didn't mention Allah's name. The blind man from the get go, he said what? For Allah to give me what? And look, Allah Akbar, what he said. After that, he said what? He says, I like that Allah may restore my eyesight so that I may see the people. Allah Akbar. Not so the people can stop talking about me. Not so the people can stop having a version of me. But I want to what? See the people. The leper was worried about what? Wow. The boy man was worried about. The blind man just wanted to. And interact with Allah's slaves. See the difference of the three men? Everybody understand this? And a talib al-ilm, you have to be willing, you have to be able to get these, these, huh? These gems from the hadith. Everybody got this? These subtle gems from the hadith. Everybody understand this or not? Khayna, and it's a huge difference. And it's one of the reasons why Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Hab, rahimahullah, placed this hadith in Kitab al-Tawheed. Because it pertains to Tawheed as well. Everybody understand this? But this is subtle. That's why you have to be trained to look for these things. Now, I mean, these. Khayran, inshallah. Moving forward. It says, what kind of property do you like best? He replied, sheep. The angel gave him a pregnant sheep. He didn't say a camel. He didn't say a cow. A big, luxurious, expensive animal. Just give me something simple I can eat from. It can take care. And that's it. He was humble from the get-go. And there are hadith about camels and sheep herders. And the difference between the two. The pride, the arrogance, the pomp that comes with camel herders. Naam? And the concept of the prophets, the MBA, having sheep and goat that they looked after. The nature of the sheep is totally different than the nature of the camel, the cow, the size of the animal, the meat of the animal. It's a difference. Everybody understand this? These are all subtleties from the hadith. This blind man was humble. He was simple. He didn't want too much. He didn't want a lot. A few basic things. Everybody got this? Khairan, inshallah. Moving forward. Afterwards, all the three pregnant animals gave birth to young ones. And multiplied and brought forth so much that each of one of the three men had a herd of camels, uh, of, of camels, a valley, and one had a herd of cows filling the valley, filling the valley, and one had a flock of sheep filling the valley. Then the angel, disguised in the shape and appearance of a leper. So the angel initially went to them how? The angel initially went to them in the form of a man or in the form of an angel? Which of the two? Huh? A man. Secondly, the angel came back in the form of what? A leper. In other words, based off of the interpretation that we mentioned that he was a man, he was normal. Then he came in a state that was similar to theirs. Everybody understand this? It says, uh, went to the leper and said, I'm a poor man who has lost all means of livelihood while on a journey. So none will satisfy my need except Allah and then you. I ask you, and by the one who gave you such nice color and beautiful skin and so much property, I ask you to give me a camel so that I may reach my destination. The man replied, I have many obligations. Allah Akbar. Like people say today, I got bills. Say what? I got bills. It's real. I can't help you. I'm sorry. Now, I'm, you say this in New York, right, Nafis? Say, I have, I have my own bills. I have my own responsibilities. I have my own life. I can't help you. A man may say this to his own mother. His mother's sick. He needs, she needs attention. He says, I have my own life. I don't have time to look after my mother all day. Everybody understand this? So it says here, the angel said, I think I know you. Were you not a leper to whom the people had a strong aversion? Weren't you a poor man? And then Allah gave you all this property? He replied, this is all wrong. I have this property through inheritance from my forefathers. The angel said, if you're telling a lie, then let Allah make you as you were before. 
Then the angel disguised in the shape and appearance of a bald man went to the bald man and said the same as he told the first one. And he to answer the same as the first one did. The angel said, if you're telling a lie, then may Allah make you as you were before. Then the angel disguised in the shape of a blind man went to the blind man and said, I'm a poor man and a traveler whose means of livelihood have been exhausted while on journey. I have nobody to help me except Allah and then you. I ask you by the one who gave you, this is another, it's a mistake here in English. It says, I ask you by the one, period. Then a new sentence, who gave you back your eyesight to give me a sheep so that with his help I may complete my journey? The man said, no doubt. I was blind and Allah gave me back my eyesight. I was poor and Allah made me rich. So take anything you wish from my property. By Allah, I will not stop you from taking anything, parentheses, you need of my property, which you may take for Allah's sake. The angel replied, keep your property with you. Four, i.e. three men have been tested and Allah is pleased with you and angry with your two companions. This is an amazing hadith. Beautiful hadith. Full of fawaid. From the beginning of the hadith to the end of the hadith. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to dissect it. And take every single ruling from aqidah, fiqh, adab, akhlaq, sadaqah, etc. Khayyad, inshallah, the highlighting point from the hadith is that everyone is going to be tested in this dunya. All of us. The rich and the poor. Those who have good color, those who have bad color. Those who have good skin, those who have bad skin. Those who have good hair, those who have bad hair. Those who have cows, camels, sheep. You have this health issue, this problem. Allah is going to test us all. Is Allah pleased with us or displeased with us? When we get things, when we get ni'mah, do we thank Allah for them? Do we even attribute those blessings to Allah? I worked hard for this. I studied hard, I worked hard, I worked two jobs, I went to school, I worked my butt off. That's what people say. I deserve this. It's, not, it's unfair for you to treat me like this. And people, they forget to mention Allah's name. Allah gave me this. Allah allowed me this. It's not right for you to te- treat me like this because of Allah's rights. So on and so forth. So it's a very important concept from this hadith. The concept of patience, the concept of shukr, the concept of Allah testing people in this dunya, and also melting the heart. Melting the heart. Khair inshallah. Allah di ba'da. Zahid wa qillati dunya wa sabri anha wa ahdi wa rata shajar. An Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas radhi Allahu anhu qal Wallahi inni la awwalu rajulin min al-arabi Wallahi inna la awwala Inni? Inni la awwalu rajulin min al-arabi rama bi sahmin fi sabidillah wa laqad kunna naghzu ma'a rasulidahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ما لنا طعام نأكله إلا ورق ورق الحبلة وهذا السم هذا السمر حتى إن أحدنا لا يضع كما تضع الشاة ثم أصبحت بنوي أسد ثم أصبحت ثم أصبحت بنو أسد تعزرني على الدين لقد خبت إذا وضل عملي طيب الذي بعده عن خالد بن عمير عمير عن خالد بن عمير العدوي قال خطبنا عتبة بن غزوان فحمد الله عتبة عتبة بن غزوان فحمد الله عتبة بن غزوان عتبة بن غزوان فحمد الله وأثنى عليه ثم قال أما بعد فإن الدنيا قد آذنت بصرم وولت حداء وولت حداء حذاء وولت حداء ولم يبق منها إلا صدابة كصدابة الإناء أن الحجر أن الحجر يبقى من شف من شفة جهنم فيهوى فيها سبعين عاما لا يدرك لها قعرا والله لتم والله لتم لا أن لتم لا أن فأعجبتم أفع أفعجبتم ولقد ذكر لنا لنا وقد ذكر لنا وقد ذكر لنا أن ما بين مصراعين من مصارع الجنة مسيرة أربعين سنة مسيرة أو مسيرة مسيرة أربعين هذا هذا أيوة ولا يأتين عليها يوم وهو كضير من الزحام ولقد رأيتني سبع سبعة مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما لنا طعام إلا ورق الشجر حتى قرحت أشداقنا فالتقطت بردة فشققتها بيني وبين سعد بن مالك فاتزرت بنصفها واتزر سعد قال فاتزرت 
فاتزرت بنصفها واتزر سعد بنصفها فما أصبح اليوم منا أحد إلا أصبح أميرا على مصر من الأمصار وإني أعوذ بالله أن أكون في نفسي عظيما وعند الله صغيرا الله أكبر وإنما لم تكن وإنها وإنها لم تكن نبوة قط إلا تناسخت حتى يكون آخر عاقبتها منك فستخ فستخب فستخبرون وتجربون الأمراء بعدنا طيب says here chapter 11 patience and hunger in this world patience and hunger in this world in Arabic it doesn't necessarily say all of, say that it says باب في قلة الدنيا having a few things from the worldly life. وَالصَّبْرِ عَنْهَا Patience, therefore. وَأَكْلِي وَرَقِ الشَّجَرِ And eating leaves. Eating leaves. In other words, not having no food. Not snails, not grasshoppers, locusts, fish, rabbits, these things that people look down upon. Leaves of a tree. Mushrooms. No. Leaves of a tree. That's the only thing that we have to eat. Yeah, no, ever had a, a tree leaf before? Anyone raise your hand if you ever had a grasshopper or a locust? Have you ever had if you have anyone ever eat a, a grasshopper or locust before? Uh-huh. Now just think about that. Eating a grasshopper. Taking a grasshopper or a locust, putting it on a stick, and roasting it on a campfire. Honestly. Or eating it eating it raw. Let alone eating a tr a leaf from a tree. That's dinner. That's lunch. Bismillah. Everybody understand this? This is severe. Okay? It says here, patience and hunger in this world. Tayyip. Hadith number 2084. Sa'ad ibn Abu Waqas says here, Radiallahu anhu said, I was the first man among the Arabs to shoot an arrow for a lost cause. We used to fight in a lost cause while we had nothing to eat except the leaves of hubla and the sumar trees, desert trees. And as a result, therefore, we were discharged, or we discharged excrement like that of a sheep, i.e. unmixed droppings. You eat it, comes out as if you, what, as the way, what? You ate it. Everybody understand this? It says here, yeah, I need, you ever, anyone ever slaughter a sheep, you go to the slaughterhouse. Before you slaughter the animal, the animal becomes afraid or startled or whatever. And you see that the droppings, the excrement is what color? Green, just like grass. Just like you ate it, what? Have I got this? It says here, uh, like that of a sheep. Today, the people of the tribe of Banu Asad teach me religion and try to impose punishment upon me. That translation, we don't have time to get into that right now. It says, if so, then I'm lost. And all my efforts that I had a uh, hard time had gone in vain. al muhim the highlighting point of the hadith teaches us that the Sahaba sacrificed and they suffered. They ate from the tree or from the leaves of a tree, showing that there are people who are better than you, closer to Allah, more knowledgeable, more pious, more righteous, more sincere, and they had far less than you did. And they had far less than you did. So just think about that. The next time you wish to make a complaint, you want to complain, oh, I don't got no money. Oh man, I want to get married. I can't find a wife. I can't gather. I can't gather. There's someone who's closer to Ar Rahman that had far less than you did. So be thankful for what you have and don't complain about struggling, ya akhi. Don't quit your studies. Don't drop out of school because you don't have food. Don't drop out of school because you don't have money. Keep studying, keep learning, be patient. Be in the night ta'ala, huh? the end will be good for you. As long as you're sincere and as long as you work hard. As long as you're sincere and as long as you work hard. And just because you don't have a lot of money, you don't have food, you're struggling, you're just studying, it doesn't mean that Allah is displeased with you. And those who do have money, those who do eat this every day and have this comfort and have this luxury, it doesn't mean that they're studying correctly. It doesn't mean that they're better than you. It doesn't mean that they're close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So some speaking to Tullab al Poverty cannot divert you from your studies. Poverty should only make you stronger. It should only give you more resolve. It should cause you to focus more on your studies and not the opposite. And Allah has no doubt from the things that I see today, from those who want to go overseas, they want to go to Medina, they want to study, write me a letter of recommendation. Please write me a Tazkiyah, please write me a Tazkiyah. Nine out of ten of them, they aren't willing to sacrifice anything from the dunya. 
They're not willing to go through any type of hardship, any type of difficulty. And they think they're studying as a piece of cake or a bed of roses. La, la, fumma, la. And tabihu. Please pay close attention to this. Khair inshallah. Next hadith, 2085. Khalid bin Umayr al Adabi reported, Uthman bin Ghazwan delivered a speech. Praise the Lord and said, This word is nearing to its end, which is only like little remains in a vessel which one tries to catch. You would go to one another. Uh, there where is no mortality. So take with you the best available for you, as I heard that when a stone is thrown in hell, it travels seven years before reaching its bottom. La ilaha illallah. But hell will be filled. I swear by Allah, are you amazed? He also said that between the doors of Jannah, one may travel 40 years and it will be crowded. One day. He added, I was the seventh of men who were with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who fed on only treaties until our lips became ulcerated. And I had to share with Sa'ad bin Malik one garment after cutting into two lower garments. But today, each of us is a ruler somewhere. So I take protection with Allah to be big in my eyes, but little before Allah. There was never prophethood, but it was reduced to monarchy. You will experience and try the rulers after us. Chapter 12 says, باب يرجع عن الميت أهله وماله ويبقى عمله عن أنس بن مالك رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يتبع الميت ثلاثة فيرجع اثنان ويبقى واحد يتبع أهله وماله وعمله فيرجع أهله وماله ويبقى عمله Chapter 12 says the relatives and wealth of the deceased Hadith 2086 Anas bin Malik رضي الله عنه narrated that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when a dead is carried to his grave he is followed by three two of which return after his burial and one remains with him his relatives, his property, and his deeds follow him. Relatives and his property return back while his deeds remain with him. It's meant to soften the heart. The reality that all of these worldly possessions are going to go away from you. Your friends, your companions, your wife, your this and your that, they're going to leave you. And the only thing that's going to stay with you is your deeds, your actions, good or bad, righteousness or wickedness. Everybody understand this? And also from the aspect of Tulab al ilm. Huh? What is the knowledge that you spread among the people? What type of sacrifice did you make in the dunya to spread the beneficial knowledge to defend the sunnah, to raise the sunnah? That's also going to remain with you in your grave. Next chapter says, Babun unzur ila man asfala minkum iqra. Chapter 13, look at the less fortunate among you. Hadith 2087, the Messenger of Allah said, said, look at those who are less fortunate than yourselves, not those who are better off than yourselves, so that you would not belittle the graces of Allah. This is a tremendous paramount hadith. Whenever you want to complain about anything, think about those who have far less. I have a headache, my back hurts, my knee hurts, this and that. There are people who don't have legs. There are people who don't have arms. There are people who are paralyzed, paraplegic. There are people who can't move their fingers, can't blink their eyes. There are people that are sitting in a hospital bed as we speak right now, connected to things, things plugged up to them as we speak. And we complain about this pain and about this type of agony. There are people who have no food, no water, no thi nothing to eat. And we complain, I don't like this. It's too spicy. It's too salty. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too kether. It's too kether. Don't look at those who are above, but look at those who are what? Beneath you. Because if you do this, you'll value what Allah has truly given you. What Allah has what? Truly given you. And the same applies to knowledge as well. Somebody says, well, those ulama who came before me, there's no comparison between me. The ulama of today, Sheikh bin Abbas, Sheikh bin Uthaymin, Sheikh al-Albani, we have nothing compared to them. So therefore, there are no scholars in the West. There's no true students of knowledge. There's no kether. Don't look at those who are above you. Look at those who are what? Beneath you. There's some places in which the people don't have a clue about the sunnah. They don't have a clue about Sayyid al-Bukhari. Wallahi, without any exaggeration, we've been to some of those places. Where basic, simple rulings of wudu and salah and hijab and aqidah, they never even heard of in their lives. And don't just think just in America, in the lands of the Muslims, in the Middle East, in North Africa. You may go to places and which things that you practice, that you're differing over, that you're fighting over, that you're talking about someone else over, they never ever heard of. I never knew that was a hadith. I never knew this was a, a, a part of their religion. So don't always look at those who are above you and scorn yourselves. Look at those who are beneath you. Appreciate and value the ilm that Allah has given you. 
with the aspiration to get more. With the humility and the humbleness not to think that you're better than those who are above you. It's a balance and there's what? There's moderation. It's a balance and there's what? There's moderation. As one of the great imams of the past said, لا يمغري طالب العلم أن يحتقر نفسه Student of knowledge shouldn't always scorn himself. Shouldn't always look down upon himself. Be happy with what Allah has given you and also strive for more. Also strive and attempt to get more. خير إن شاء الله على الذي بعده باب إن الله يحب العبد التقي الغني الخفي عن عامر بن سعد قال كان سعد بن أبي وقاص في ابنه فجاءه منه عن عمر فلما رآه سعد قال أعوذ بالله من شر هذا الراكب فنزل فقال له أنزلت في ابنك وغنمك وتركت الناس يتنازعون الملك بينهم فضرب سعد في صدره فقال اسكت سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول Inna Allah yuhibbu al-abda al-taqiyya al-ghani al-khafi. says here, chapter 14, Allah loves the slave who is pious, rich, and hidden. Kaif, how is this? How can someone be pious, rich, and hidden at the same time? How is that? Pious, rich, and hidden. You're pious, well off, and no one knows about you. No one sees you. No one hears you. Everybody understand this? That's deep. There's another uh, variation of this hadith. Bilha al muhmala. Inna Allah yuhib al abda al taqiya al ghaniya al hafi. Hunaka riwaya huna. Bilha al mu'jama. Bilha al mu'jama. Al khafi. Khair inshallah. Uh, it says here, Hadith number 2088, Ahmad bin Sa'd reported that Sa'd ibn Bukhas was in his camel pasture when his son Umar came riding. He was on his farm with his animals and he saw his son coming. His son was riding and he saw Allah's refuge, Allah's protect you, protection from his own son. A'udhu billahi min sharri hadha rakib Then when his son got off of his horse, or got off his camel, uh, he said, have you left the people competing and ruling and you came to your camels and sheep? You've abandoned the other sahaba, the other tabi'in that may be fighting and differing over who's the leader, who's the khalifa, who's in charge, who's the governor, so on and so forth. Are you hearing your, your camel pastor looking after animals? His son was criticizing him and was rebuking him. His son was enjoying the good and forbidding the evil according to what he believed and what he thought. Everybody understand the hadith? You've left the people you, as they say today, you're in the masjid and you leave the people to fight over the politics of the country. You're in the masjid praying, making salat with rosary beads. And people getting killed and murdered and shot in the streets. Everybody understand this? As we hear today. So Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, it says here, um, struck him in his chest. He hit him. Shut up. Uskut, be quiet. Because... I heard the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam saying, and Allah yuhibd al abd al taqi al ghani al khafi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, saying, Allah loves the slave who is pious, rich, and hidden. In other words, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he used the sunnah against his son. And his son was using something against him. So they had a debate. And Sa'd radiallahu anhu, he used the dalil. He used the proof directly from the sunnah. And he said, I heard Allah's Messenger saying that Allah loves a slave. Who has wealth, who has piety, who has taqwa, but he's khafi. He's away from the people. He's out of the eyes of the people. He's not in the limelight. He's not in the mix involved with all of the chaos of the people. Everybody understand this? Everybody clear on this? So this hadith it teaches us the concept of zuhd. It teaches the concept of avoiding problematic situations. And it teaches the concept is that everyone has their own place. There's some people that should be hidden. That should be behind. That should be away from the drama. The day-to-day -day politics, the problems. And there are other ahadith that teach us the virtue of a righteous imam. The virtue of a righteous leader. The virtue of he who is brave, he who speaks the truth. Everybody understand this? Everyone is not supposed to be hidden. Everyone can't go to their farms and just, you know, raise their families and, and avoid the people. No. Some people have to be in the main city. Some people can live on the outskirts. Everybody got this? But the position of Sa'ad radiallahu anhu was to avoid the fighting of the people. Everybody got this? The position of Sa'ad was this hadith. Everybody understand this? 
And this also applies to tulab al-ilm. There's some students of knowledge which shouldn't be on the front line. You shouldn't speak. You shouldn't give the khutbah. You can be in the library, writing, translating, teaching, that's fine. And there are other tulab al-ilm who should and need and must be on the forefront. And it is unlawful for a person to say, well, I don't want to be in front of the people. Or I'm too humble, I'm too shy. Because that's now cowardice. Somebody has to be brave enough to get on the minbar. Someone has to be in front of the people, addressing the people, dealing with the people's problems. And the other tulab al there are other scholars that are researchers. I don't speak well, I'm not a good public speaker, I'm shy, I write books. I teach people, I train people, that's fine. Everyone has their what? Has their place. Everyone has their what? Has their place. Just like there are hadith on the virtue of being poor and pious, there are hadith on the virtue of being rich, wealthy, powerful, influential, and righteous, and thankful. Obviously, it differs from the person and from the what? And from the place. Everybody got this? And this hadith also shows us how uh, much the sunnah was respected by the salaf of Saleh. Hasad ibn Muqasr, he repeated his own flesh and blood, his own son. He told him to be quiet because I heard something from Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. A sunnah hi al-hujjah. The sunnah is the ultimate proof and the ultimate argument when we have a difference of opinion. Khayran inshallah, ala di ba'da. باب أشرك في عمله غير الله سبحانه عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الله تبارك وتعالى أنا أغنى الشركاء عن الشرك من عمل عملا أشرك فيه من عمل من عمل عملا أشرك فيه أو أشرك فيه معي غيري تركته وشركه Chapter 15 Association with Allah Associating partners with Allah in your ibadah Hadith 2089, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrated that the Messenger of Allah said, Allah the Exalted said, I am the one who stands in need of no partner. So, he who performs an act of worship dedicating it to someone else beside me, I discard him along with his association. What does the hadith have to do with the chapter of Zuhd? Shows us the danger of shirk, especially hidden shirk. Shirk that's hidden. The shirk that you may fall into, that the shaitan tries to get you to perform and to, uh -huh, to take place. Especially when it comes to talab al ilm Seeking knowledge and giving dawah Showing off, seeking reputation, seeking fame Seeking power and position, status, etc. This is very dangerous for the talab al It's very what? It's extremely dangerous So the moment that you make shirk Allah has nothing to do with you Allah has nothing to do with you Unless you make repentance Unless you return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And Allah's ghafoor rahim Even for shirk akbar Let alone shirk asghar uh, the munafiqeen, if they repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they make their deeds, wa akhlasulillah, huh? They make their religion sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will forgive them. However, if you make this shirk, if you have this nifaq, if you worship the people, if you make shirk with Allah, Allah will abandon you and leave you and your deeds. This is the munasabah of Yani Irad Hadha Hadith fi kitab Zuhdi wa Raqaiq. With regards to melting and softening the heart. And also, as we apply it to tulab al in, make sure your intention is there, ya akhi. Make sure your intention is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Check your niyyah. Check your niyyah. Khayr inshaAllah. The next hadith, next chapter. Babun? Babun man sami'a. Man sami'a. Man sami'a wa ra'a bi amal. An abhi, an ibn Abbas wa dirlahu anhu ma qal, kana Rasulullah qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, من سمع من سمع سمع الله به ومن رأى ومن رأى ومن رأى رأى الله به. Says chapter sixteen, speaking and showing off deeds. Not necessarily the يعني most valid translation. سمع could be speaking of your good deeds, but not يعني سمع is seeking reputation, wishing for people to hear about you, and then رأى is wishing people to see you, doing it in front of the people. Everybody understand this? And this obviously we all know how it pertains to talab al ilm huh? and giving dawah. Are you teaching the people because you want to do it for the sake of Allah? That you're afraid of standing in front of Allah? Allah allowed you to memorize the Quran, to study, to learn, and the people need the knowledge and you don't teach? Or are you doing this for people say, MashaAllah, Fulan Hafid, 
فلان طالب العلم فلان قوي طيب متمكن he's this and he's that and so on and so forth are you seeking knowledge so you can come back to your country and the people offer you wives offer you women to marry and divorce 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 are you seeking him to have the biggest house the biggest car to have your own personal driver chauffeur are you seeking in people to offer you things this is a reality <coughs> This is a reality, especially in Canada, in the UK, and in America. This is a reality. What is your intention for Talib al -Ilm? For the people to hear about you, to see you, or for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So this hadith here teaches us, 2089, Abu Hurairah narrated that the Messenger of Allah said, uh, 2090, Ibn Abbas narrated that the Messenger of Allah said, He who lets people hear of his good deeds intentionally will to win their praise. Huh? To win their praise. It's not haram to tell somebody about the good deeds that you did with an intention. With hikmah, to inspire others. Yes, I made hajj, and you can do it too. Yes, I memorized the Quran, and you can do it too. I went overseas, I studied, I got this degree, and Khalid, you can do it too. There's nothing wrong with telling someone about your good deeds, your virtues, with that intention. Everybody understand this? There's nothing wrong with that. However, to seek the people's praise, clap, pat on the back. This is my daughter, this is my sister, this is my house. Take this money, take this position, take this status. That's a different story. Everybody understand this? That's a what? That's a different story. Doing things in front of the people. And then, uh, yeah, I wanna, uh, yeah, I need, uh, everyone go back to five minutes of faida. If you already haven't watched it, call it Worthless. It's a two part five minutes of faida that we did call it Worthless. Very important concept of the struggle of the Tulab al -Idn. You have more respect, more appreciation for Tulab al if you watch this. Because you're between a battle now. I have to prepare for the khutbah. I have to make sure that everything that I say is crisp and is sharp and is accurate. I have to be eloquent. I have to speak. I have to address the people. I should look nice. I should be in a presentable fashion. How can I do all of these things and then also have the intention only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The thin line between perfecting my craft and showing off. The thin line of me guaranteeing you and offering you a specific level of quality and seeking the fame and reputation of the people. Everybody understand this? Everybody got this? The thin line of you speaking eloquently, talking properly, being intellectual, being smart, so on and so on and so forth, and not liking your voice and not liking what you say and the people to enjoy your class. It's a struggle and it's a battle. How do you be humble but at the same time honor ilm? And make the people respect ilm. Have I understand this? You're carrying around something that is so valuable and expensive and costly, yet still you have to have your head down. There lies no doubt. That is a deep struggle that every student of knowledge, every half of the Quran has to fight on a daily basis. And the moment you don't fight this battle, the shaitan will get you. Have I understand this? Not to humiliate yourself, not to reject Allah's blessings, but at the same time, not to. Put yourself on the pedestal. Everybody got the point or not? Everybody clear this? And this is a very difficult struggle. Only those who deal with da'wah, deal with teaching, can truly understand what I'm saying. Uh, when you're reciting the Qur'an, are you not supposed to beautify your voice? So it's not beautifying your voice, doing it for the people to hear it and benefit and learn from it? And oh, the recitation was beautiful? How can you do that and not have an intention for the people? Everybody understand the point? You're beautifying your voice for what? For the people to hear, for the people to listen to the recitation of the Salat, for them to cry, for their hearts to become soft. How can you do that and not have no type of egotism in your heart? Everybody understand this? This is why seeking knowledge is so virtuous. And it's why only true people that can learn and excel in the ilm are those who are strong. Those who are strong. And the greatest strength is fighting your nafs and conquering your own ego. Khairan, inshallah. Uh, chapter number 17 says, Babun al mutakallim Chapter 17 says bad words. كيف هذه ترجمة سامر؟ Straight to the point, huh? In Arabic it says, Al Mutakalim Bil Kalima Yahwi Bihaf al It says, Al Mutakalim, somebody says something, makes a statement, 
which will call him to fall into the fire. So the translation is a bit, yeah, I mean, it's very shabby actually. Because when you say a bad word, it's automatically thinking about a curse word, slandering someone, something like that. But that's not, it was meant in a hadith. You may say something that could be from the deen, that could be from the religion. However, how you said it, when you said it, or to who you said it to, or that what you said before or after it causes you to go to hell. But not necessarily a bad thing. Everybody understand this? So I have to be careful. Everybody understand this? You may get, say something of khair, but you do it for other than Allah. You may have jealousy for the religion. Mm -hmm. You may have jealousy for the deen. But you say it in a heedless, careless manner, and it causes you to go to the nar. So it's not necessarily just bad words. Everybody got this? Khair, inshallah. We're running out of time. We don't have the time to really get loose how we want to, Abdurrahman. Khair, inshallah. says here, uh, chapter or hadith number 2091. Abu Hurairah uh, he said that the, her, I heard, he heard the Messenger of Allah so saying, A slave may utter a word without considering its consequences. Uh, not necessarily saying that it's a what? A bad word. But it doesn't mean that it's a bad word, but he doesn't consider the consequences of what he said, the, reper the repercussions of what he said, the effects of his words, and it will cause him to fall in the fire. As far away as the distance between the east and the west. This obviously shows the concept of softening the heart. How big the hellfire is. And how simple, how easy it is to go to hell. You're not being mindful and you're not being conscious of what you say. Obviously this directly pertains to Tulab al -in. Talking about somebody. Fulan is Khabith. He's this and he's that and this and he's that. You don't know, Ya Akhi, that man can be praying at night. He can be crying at night. He can be reading the Quran at night when you're sleeping, when you're drinking, when you're watching and doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. You don't know how close that man is to Allah. You do not know how close he is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you slander him and you disparage him and you talk about him and this and that. And you may go to hell. You don't even realize it. Why the other You don't know how much benefit this one scholar has made. How much of the sunnah he spread, how much bid'ah he destroyed, how many graves and shirk and kufr and superstitions that Allah allowed him to eradicate in this country. An uh, issue comes up, a statement that you don't agree with, ijtihad, let alone just pure envy and jealousy. And you start talking about him and refuting him, he's khabid and he's this, and the judge, shaitan, kafah, whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't know what Allah has accepted from his deeds. You don't know how close he is to Allah. You don't know the dua that people may be making for him. The lives that Allah allowed this man to change. Before this sheikh came and visited our country, visited our markas, we worshipped graves. We swore by Allah and Allah. We wore tamim and ta'weez and this and that. And by Allah's permission, he came and taught us tawheed and sunnah and ilm. He changed our lives. You don't know what status this person has with Allah. You start talking about him recklessly. Let alone if the information is totally wrong, totally inaccurate, totally fabricated. And this happens on a daily basis. It may be happening as we speak right now in Toronto, Ontario. Heedless, reckless. No knowledge, no patience, no nothing. Fatwas. It's halal. There's nothing wrong with this. It's permissible to do this. The beard is only a sunnah. No, there's nothing wrong with that. You can have riba house. It's okay. It's different. You're in Canada. You're in America. Fatwa after fatwa after fatwa after fatwa after fatwa after fatwa after fatwa. Without being mindful of the consequences of the tongue. This hadith is to soften one's heart. Especially a talib al ilm. Be mindful of what you say. Watch your tongue. Think before you speak. Think before you move. Before you move that piece on the board, think about what can happen when I pick up this piece and move it to the next square. What's going to happen? What's going to take place? Think before you move. Be mindful of what you say. How much harm has come from people to labyrinth talking recklessly. Huh? The hellfire is a reality. May Allah protect us from that place. I mean. Next hadith. Bab al Mumin Mm -hmm. 
It says chapter 18, the believer is rewarded for bad and good fate. The believer is rewarded for bad and good fate. Yani, al mumin amruhu khayrun kulluhu. Is that it's all good for the believer. Regardless whether he's rewarded one way or another, it's always good. The believer is he who rolls with the punches, goes with the grain and never against the grain. He takes it in stride. Something happens to me, alhamdulillah. Something comes to me, alhamdulillah. Allah blesses me with something, I'm thankful. Something that's taken away from me, I'm put through a trial, sickness, affliction, death of a loved one, marriage, divorce, this, that. He's patient. He's patient. He doesn't complain. He doesn't stop. He doesn't quit. Everything that happens to you is a good thing. Everybody understand this? Especially for a student of knowledge. If they hold you up in the airport, they question you, you have to sit there for three hours, for four hours, for eight hours, you read a book. You study, you make review, you make tasbih, you make your adhkar. Only Allah knows what would happen to you if you left the airport. What Allah protected you from, what Allah kept you, kept you safe from. Everybody understand this? There's no need to complain. I'm not going to give da'wah no more because they held me up in the airport. I'm not going to give da'wah no more because this happened to me and Fulan warned against me. Your affair is good if you take it in stride. And asabatu sarra'u shakara. Good comes to you, money, wealth, prosperity, ease, simplicity. They say all praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We thank Allah. Let me do more. Let me give more. Let me offer more. And if something is taken away from you, hardship comes, difficulty comes, you do what? Sabara. Don't complain. Don't cry out. Don't lose your spirit. Don't quit. Don't stop teaching. Don't stop giving da'wah because some type of musibah happened to you. Everybody understand this? And if you do this, the Prophet is telling us in simple basic terms, it's no way that you can lose. Just imagine that your life is always good for you. There is no depression. There is no suicidal thoughts. There is no need for alcohol and for this pill and for this one and that one. That non-Muslims and weak Muslims need and suffer from. Non-Muslims and Muslims with low iman suffer from. Everybody understand this? This hadith is considered a pillar of psychology. There's no way that your life is bad if you have this scope. Everybody understand this? And most people, obviously, they're far from this hadith. Well, unfortunately, non-Muslim and Muslims with weak iman, with ignorance, Muslims who are heedless. Obviously, it's easier said than done. It's practice. Women yatasabar, men yastagni, men yastafif. You have to try, you have to attempt. Everybody understand this? You have to give an effort to be on this level of looking at life like this, especially when it comes to <coughs> da'wah and to talab al ilm There's nothing wrong, nothing is happening. Are you upset? You missed your flight? Fulan doesn't sit with you no more? Fulan doesn't sit with your class? Say what? Alhamdulillah. That's fine. It's no problem. It's not affecting me. It's not bothering me. Are you understanding this? And your life will never ever be at loss. Khairin inshaAllah. Aladhi ba'du? عند الابتداء وقصة أصحاب الأخدود عن صهيب رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال كان ملك في من كان قبلكم وكان له ساحر فلما كبر قال للملك للملك إني قد كبرت فبعث إلي غلاما أعلمه السحر فبعث إليه غلاما يعلمه فكان في طريقه إذا سلك راهب فقعد إليه وسمع كلامه وسمع فسمع كلامه فأعجبه فكان إذا أتى الساحر مر بالراهب وقعد إليه فإذا أتى الساحر ضربه فشكى ذلك إلى الراهب فقال إذا خشيت إذا خشيت الساحر فقل حبسني أهلي وإذا خشيت أهلك فقل حبسني الساحر فبينما هو كذلك إذا أتى على دابة عظيمة قد حبست الناس فقال اليوم أعلم الساحر اليوم أعلم الساحر أفضل أم الراهب أفضل فأخذ حجرا فقال اللهم إن كان أمر إن كان أمر الراهب أحب إليك من أمر الساحر فاقتل هذه الدابة حتى يمضي الناس فرماها فقتلها ومضى الناس فأتى الراهب فأخبره فأتى الراهب فأتى الراهب فأخبره فقال له الراهب أي أي بني أي بني أي بني أنت اليوم أفضل مني قد بلغ من أمريكا ما أرى وإنك ستبتلى 
Patience for Allah's pleasure. Yani once again, being patient to keep your deen. Having sabr to keep your religion. Naam, no matter what. Naam, in many parts of the world today, uh, people who suffer from things, let's say poverty, famine, all right, political unrest, whatever the case may be, they never ever lose the sense of honor. They never ever lose the sense of honor. You may go some places and a person has no money, no wealth. You offer them something, you try to buy them something, and they will vehemently refuse. No way. You can't buy it. I won't take it. I won't eat it. They're poor, they're hungry, they're starving. Why don't they take the gift and accept the money or whatever it can be? Because of what? Their honor. Family name, family honor. A guest comes over. No, I'll sleep on the floor, you're sleeping on the bed. No, I want to sleep on the floor. My back, no. They swear by Allah. No, no, no. You're going to sleep on the bed, everyone else will sleep on the floor. Everyone else will sleep on the sofa. We'll sleep on the couches. We'll sleep outside. You take the heater, whatever the case may be. Many, many countries like this. 
Why are they willing to sacrifice and suffer and refuse a basic simple gift with no strings attached? Because of what? The honor. Everybody understand this? Why don't Muslims have this same sense of the deen? If I have no money, we don't, we're not taking the debt from the riba bank. I'm not taking off my hijab to go work. I'm not shaving my beard to get a job. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Because of what? The, nah. Because of the deen. Because of the what? The deen. Everybody understand this? If the Muslims had that same rough and tough skin when it came to holding fast for the deen that they have for respect and holding fast to their cultural honor, we would be far better off. We would be what? Far better off. Everybody understand this? Everybody got this or not? Well, I'm sure many of you people can relate to this. You may go somewhere, someone has nothing. They won't take a dime from you because of shame. But when it comes to the religion, they're instantly willing to sacrifice the deen, sacrifice the religious practices, sacrifice the obligatory things because of worldly gain. And they say, What are we to do? It's 2016. I have to work in a bank. If I don't work in a bank, we're not going to have no food. If I don't work in a bank, we're not going to have kether. He doesn't say the same when it comes to the what? Worldly cultural honor. Everybody understand this? So this chapter heading is teaching us about having sabr for the deen. If someone tries to burn you, someone cuts you in half, someone wants to do this to you, do that to you, torture you, punish you, never ever give up, sell, and throw away your what? Your deen. Everybody understand this? Everybody got this? So this is the concept of melting the heart. And the same applies to seeking knowledge as well. Ya akhi. No matter what the people try to do to you, no matter what they do to you, never ever lose your spirit as a student of knowledge. No one should take you away from you being a student of the Qur'an, no matter what. No matter what. Everybody understand this? No matter what they try to do to you, no matter what harm they may throw your way, you are a student of knowledge, a bearer of knowledge. Everybody got this? Everybody understand this or not? You have money, no money. You're married, divorced, children. No one is sitting, no matter what the case, you stay, stick to your principles and to your values. I can't do this because it goes against my teachings. I can't do this because I've studied the Quran. It's impossible for me to, you want me to do this and say this and mention this on the minbar. I can't do that. I'm sorry. Everybody understand this? Student of knowledge, you must have tough and thick skin. You must be willing to deal and put up with the harm and the annoyance of the people. And if you're not, you're unsuitable for seeking knowledge and teaching knowledge. Get another job. If you're sensitive and you worry about somebody talking about you or saying something about you or doing something to you, brother speaks to you one day, the next day he doesn't speak to you, then you should do what, Samir? Get another job, get another profession. It's not for you. So that's what this chapter is talking about. Keeping your religion, even if someone wishes to burn you alive, even if someone wishes to punish you and torture you, keep your religion, keep your deen, keep your values. Khairan, inshallah. This is a very long hadith. Uh, obviously, we don't have time to explain it, but we're just going to give a few basic points, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hadith number 2093, Suhaib narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, There was a king among those before you. He had a magician. When the magician grew old, he said to the king, Send me a boy that I may teach him magic. So the king sent him a boy to teach. The boy used to pass by a monk on his way to the magician. He used to listen to this monk and admire him. When he told the magician about the monk, he beat him. The boy complained to the monk about the magician. The monk told him to say to the magician, my people detain me. And say to the relatives, the magician detain me. Meanwhile, he passed one day by a great animal that scared people. The boy said, today, I will know whether the monk is right or the magician. He took a stone and said, oh Allah, if the monk was dear to you, then the magician, then kill this animal and let people go. He stoned the animal and killed it and the people went. He went to the monk and told him what had happened. The monk said, Today you are, O oh my boy, better than me. Your fear has reached a great extent. You will be tried, and if it happens, do not show people where I am. The boy started to cure the blind and those suffering from leprosy and began to treat people with many diseases. One of the king's men heard of the boy, and he was blind. The blind man collected many gifts and said, This is all for you if you treat me. The boy said, I do not cure people, but Allah Azza wa Jal does. And if you believe in Allah, I will invoke Allah who will cure you. The man believed, and the boy invoked Allah for him, and he was cured by Allah Azza wa Jal. The man went to the king's assembly, and the king asked him, Who cured you? The man said, My Rabb. It says here, My Rabb. You want a mistake in English? My Rabb, not Rabb. Allah. The king said, 
have you have a rub other than me? How did he repeat the same thing twice? And it gets worse. The man said, your and my rub is Allah. So the mistake is mentioned three times in the book. How did that happen? One typo, tayyib. Two typos, tayyib. Three consecutive typos. That's what? Extremely problematic. Everybody got this? It says Malish Abdul Rahman. Moving forward. It says here, uh, have you a rub other than me? The man said, your and my rub is Allah. The, there is another error. It says started with a K in front of it to torture him until he showed him the boy. The boy was brought to the king who said to him, my, boys, your mag my boy, your magic is so great that you cure the blind and lepers and do that and that. The boy said, I do not cure anybody but Allah as Ojah does. The king started torturing the boy until he told the king about the monk. The monk was brought and asked to abandon his religion. He refused. A saw was brought and put to his head and he was sought to death. The blind man who was cured was brought and asked to abandon his religion. He refused and he was sought to death. Then the boy was brought and asked to leave his religion. The king gave him some of his men and ordered them to take him to such and such a mountain and then throw him to die. If he does not abandon his religion, they took the boy to the mountain. The boy said, Oh Allah, protect me, protect me from them as you like. The mountain started shaking with them. They fell down and the boy returned to the king. The king asked what the men did. The boy said, Allah protected me from them. Allah will protect you if you stand up for Allah. Allah will protect you if you're doing the right thing. And also having confidence upon the truth. Having confidence upon the haq. Everybody understand this? Being strong-willed when it comes to the truth. Everybody got this? This part of the story with regards to the mountain and the boy. He was confident. He was strong-willed. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't a coward. He stood up for what he had believed in. And he knew that Allah's promise was true. He knew that Allah's promise was what? It was true. Moving forward. It then says, The king ordered some men to take him to the sea and throw him there. If he refused to abandon his religion. They took the boy and the boy said, Oh Allah, protect me from them as you like. The boat overturned and they drowned. The boy returned to the king. The king asked him what happened. And he said, Allah saved me from those men. Then he told the king that he would not be able to kill him unless he did what the boy said. The king asked him, what was it? The boy said, gather all the people in the place and then tie me to a tree. Then take one from my arrows, put it in the bow and say, with the name of Allah, the Rabb of the boy, then shoot it at me. Only then will you be able to kill me. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Only then will you kill me. If you acknowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone understand this? Just like the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim stood up for what he believed in. They were going to throw him in the fire. He wasn't a coward. He wasn't afraid. He knew what Allah said was the haq. He believed it. He was convinced. And look at the, eff the effects of his strength, his spirit, on the what? On the people and how they believed. And the same applies to da'wah. If you're truly convinced in what you're talking about, you know it's the haq. And there's no doubt about it. That's going to have an effect upon the people that you teach. If your spirit is strong, bi'idhnillah, if you're connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Allah's permission, it's going to have a what, Khalid? It's going to have an effect upon the what? Upon the people. By the sheer fact of your confidence and your conviction. If you're doubtful, if you're shaky, if you're half and half, I think, Yani, inshallah, Islam is good, but, uh, and you know, it's going to have a what? Effect on the people as well. The hadith then says, The king gathered people and tied the boy to a tree and shot an arrow after saying with the name of Allah, the rub of the boy. The boy was shot and killed. People started saying, we believe in the rub of the boy. They said it three times. In other words, the boy, he sacrificed himself for the message of Islam. He sacrificed himself for the message of Islam. And it's also a very important point for students of knowledge. You may have to suffer. You may have to give up some things. You may have to go through some sickness, through some illness, through some worries, through some problems. For the bigger benefit of da'wah. For the bigger benefit of hadith and of sunnah. Knowledge, hadith, sunnah, dawah is bigger than me. I'm willing to take the less. I'm willing to take the smaller piece, the smaller slice, and make sure that the rest of the pie is given to the people. Everybody understand this? Who's willing to have this attitude? Who has this attitude? Most people, I come first before dawah. I come before the teachings. I come before the class. I'm sick. I'm tired. I'm busy. I'm stressed. The people don't respect me. They don't pay me. Kada, 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 kada. Excuse after excuse after excuse when it should be the exact what? Opposite. You should be willing to sacrifice and suffer for the bigger goal. For the bigger goal. Not because of you and you and you and you. 
But because of Islam, because of Dawah, because of I'm teaching these Muslims that need to be taught, that want to be taught. I'm spreading the words of Allah. So I'm willing to take anything that comes with that. This is the true nature and the true spirit of a call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, after the boy was killed, uh, the courtiers said to the king, Have you seen what Allah has done? It was the same thing you were trying to avoid. All people have become believers. Allahu Akbar. The plot of the conspirers, of treacherous people, is going to backfire on themselves. They try to destroy Islam. Islam is terrorism. All Muslims are terrorists. And what happened? People start reading about Islam, studying Islam, learning about Islam, and it backfired on them. The king, the thing that he was afraid of, happened. Everybody got this? Everybody understand this? You may not see the success of your da'wah. You may not see the fruits of your labor in your lifetime. It doesn't mean that Allah is wasting them. It doesn't mean that Allah is not accepting them. Do you think all these great ulama saw what happened during their lives? Do you think Ibn Abdul Wahhab was accepted and re people responded to him and he learned his book and studied his book across the world in his lifetime? Of course not. Some people did. He saw some blessings, he saw some fruits of his labor. But Kitab al Tawheed, the Sharh, Fatul Majid being printed in India, the very first print of his book was made in India, not in Arabia. How many people, uh, do you think Ibn Abdul Hamdur in his life that that was going to happen to him? Do you think in America and Canada there were going to be people who memorized Surah Talatha, Kitab al Tawheed, Masayr al Jahiliya, Qawaid Arba? Do you think that even came across his mind? So just because you don't see everything in front of you, it doesn't mean that it isn't beneficial. And this is a major problem with people today. They quit, they stop giving classes, they stop teaching because they say, no one is listening to me. No one is watching it. No one is benefiting. There are only a few people at the masjid. There are only 500 viewers. And Fulan has 50,000 views and 5 million followers. No. It doesn't have to happen in your lifetime. It doesn't what? It does not have to happen during your lifetime. The hadith then says, uh, It was the same thing you were trying to avoid. All the people have become believers. The king ordered a dish to be made and filled with fire. Then the king said, Whoever does not abandon his religion, she'll be burnt in it. Or said, Let him enter it. The people did not abandon their religion and they were burnt. A woman came with a baby. She was reluctant to enter the ditch. But the baby said, Oh, mum, be patient as you are right. Allahu Akbar. Be patient because you're on the hawk. They don't listen. They rejected you. They made fun of you. They mocked you. This one says something about you that you didn't say. That's not true. Do what, Samir? Lish. Be, put your trust in the law. Be patient. You are on a straight path. But if you're doubtful, if you're unsure, if you're uncertain, then that's a different story. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal by His beautiful names and perfect lofty attributes to allow us to benefit from every hadith that we read and every hadith that we studied. Ameen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase all in beneficial knowledge and righteous action. Allahumma ameen. I'm so happy and grateful to Allah that we had the opportunity to start the chapter and study the hadith. Even some of them were in brief, so on and so forth. But we finished it. When that hummed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in our scale of good deeds. Jazakum Allah khairan. Thank you very much for your time, for your respect, for your attention. Uh, last but not least, after thanking Allah the Mighty the Majestic, I have to thank my brothers and sisters here at the Abu Huraira Center in Toronto, Canada. Sheikh Hassan, uh, Sheikh Samir, all of the brothers who coordinated, who helped us out to come here, who fed us food, who picked us up, who did anything to make our trip more comfortable, me and my companion Nafis. And I thank you for that. Jazakum Allah khairan. May Allah accept it from you all. Uh, the brothers, the sisters who came to the class, who participated, who sacrificed their time. Some brothers, some sisters traveled from one part of Canada to the next. May Allah give you the reward, first and foremost. And secondly, the ajr. I mean, my last piece of advice is do not allow this basic, humble presentation to be the last thing that you study from hadith. I can't give you everything. If I wanted to, I can't, because I don't have everything. I just have just a little. Time is limited. Space is limited. Resources are limited. It's your job, your responsibility to go home, pick up Mukhtasar Sahih Muslim, pick up Mukhtasar Sahih Bukhari. It's your job to go and read Fatul Bari. It's your job to read Sharh Nawi. It's your job to write something down, to research, to debate, to study, 
to continue to practice reading the hadith, memorizing the hadith, learning the hadith, teaching the hadith, having a sister's halaqa. Every Friday, there should be a sister's halaqa and sister Fulana's house. We come together and read Riyadh al We come together and we read this hadith, this song, that's your job. Only thing that I can do is pour a little bit in your cup. The rest has to be full by yourselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah give you all the tawfiq, give you all the success. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You all be safe by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakum Allahu khairan. Hada wa sallallahu wa wa barak. Ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina Muhammad. I don't know if you have some time, maybe a couple minutes before the end for the questions or ma'adri. I don't know.